Hello and welcome to another sound test bonus where I casually catch up with VGM composers about some of their latest work. In this case, I'm very pleased to welcome Gareth Coker back onto the show to discuss Ori and the Will of the Wisps, the much anticipated sequel to Ori and the Blind Forest. So hello again, Gareth. Hi Lee, how's it going? Yeah, very well, thank you. Yourself? Pretty good, um, just staying inside, um, as we've all been instructed to do. Yeah, of course, yeah, I think we'll come to that at some point in this interview, yep. but um, we've previously talked about your music for both Minecraft and the first Ori in, like, full podcasts, and um, it's going to yep. be really fantastic to speak again and carry on that musical story of Ori. Excellent, yeah, I'm, I'm looking for, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to uh, be finished with it, because it, it was a really uh, long project uh, for me, and uh, a lot of music got written, but I'm glad to... Um, have seen that the reception has been overwhelmingly positive for uh, the game and the soundtrack. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely huge. Like, even if you haven't played the game and heard it in context, context and everything, just go over to the Bandcamp release of it and just the amount of tracks, you can see how much music was written for this. Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah. Even the Bandcamp uh, release uh, is actually cut down from the music that's in the game. Um, so it's 60 tracks on the album, um, but I would say there's still a good 30 to 40 minutes that didn't make it onto the soundtrack. Well, yeah, actually, that's not a question I had written down, but it occurs to me straight away because there was an additional soundtrack released for Ori and the Blind Forest. Is it possible something like that might come for this as well? It's possible, but the, most of the content that was cut was stuff that doesn't really isn't doesn't really feel part of the narrative. I guess if there was enough demand, then I, I could include it. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll we'll have to see. Uh, we'll just have to see down the line. Um, we need to get the need to get the vinyl out first, and then I'll see like what the public demand is for other music related content for the for the second game. Of course, because this is such a, re a recent release, which has affected my interview a little bit, because I don't want to jump too far into like any specific moments or growth in the music that might come with spoilers, because it's such a recently released thing. Uh, so a lot of my questions today are mostly concerned production and how things might have expanded on the first game. And I think you'll agree that um, expansion is like a key word when it comes for, for this soundtrack. Yeah, it's... Um, I think... What we, we wanted to do, we obviously wanted to keep the, the DNA of the first game because people did did love a lot of things about it. Um, but what we didn't want to do was just make Ori 1.5 um, and just kind of, you know, make the same game with the same abilities, uh, just with new levels and new, new music and art. It really was kind of rebuilt from the ground up. Um, but retaining all of the knowledge that we got from the first game and then applying it to this to, to the rebuild um, and I think that's felt right from right from the beginning uh, the look of the game it's clearly informed by Ori in the Blind Forest but it's it's definitely more developed there's way 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 more depth um, the characters are animated differently to how they were in the first game um, and uh, just, I mean, to talk about the music, the the music just uh, is on, written on a bigger scope. It's where they use, we use a bigger orchestra and um, we have live choir this time. Um, and just on a content level, there's more environments in the game uh, and there's more characters in the game, um, which just naturally increases the scope of the music uh, and therefore it doesn't feel like Ori music 1.5 either. It also feels like the, the two version version two of the music. Um, so uh, yeah, it really ex expansion definitely is the right word. It's, it's just, it's uh, no department was resting on their laurels when they, uh, um, when it came to starting to starting the work on this game. Yeah, because obviously the uh, the very first game, we spoke about this a lot, although there was a lot of different themes in there, it was kind of built around it, this one central Ori theme, which when you first start Will of the Wisps is there in a kind of slower version that does develop differently. But it's not long before you meet Ku, the new character, yep. um, which comes with its own theme, of course. Yep. Um, yeah. So most of Act One, uh, the prologue and Act One is is focused on is focused on Ku. Um, Ku is the focus definitely of the prologue. Um, this isn't really a spoiler because it's right at the beginning of the game. Mm -hmm, um, so um, 
So, uh, yeah, Ku has a problem in the prologue and Ori helps Ku solve the problem. I won't say what the problem is just in case you haven't played it. Um, and uh, whereas the prologue in the first game uh, generally revolved around a feeling of sadness due to the loss of a, of a parent character, uh, this is more about a family working together to overcome a problem, which is also something that everyone can relate to. Um, when we, I remember when we first started working on the opening of this game, we were like, well, we can't just do the same thing that we did in Blind Forest because people will call us out for that. Um, but we wanted people to get you know, the same kind of sense of purpose and motivation to, to play the game. But it's like, what emotion are we going to focus on? And it is, it is a different one that we have this time around, but I think we still have a similar success in helping the players connect again to Ori, but also to Ku. Because um, all of Act 1 is basically Ori is searching for Ku, because something happens at the end of the prologue that causes Ori and Ku to get separated. Um, so, yeah, that was something uh, that obviously I had to look at in the music, um, because Ku needs a theme. Um, so that's just the example of one character that needs a new theme, and because she's kind of a, a focus for, for a lot of Act 1, um, she needed her own melody. Um, but there are various other non-playable characters, significant non-playable characters, most notably Quolok, um, who is a giant toad that you meet uh, about halfway through Act 1 of the game. Um, that he has his own theme in the bass clarinet, um, which also pops up in a couple of other places um, as the story goes. Um, then uh, Shriek, the main antagonist, uh, Shriek also has her own theme. Um, and in this game, you spend more a little bit more time with Shriek than you did with Kuro, the main antagonist of the first game. Um, so there's a, there's a little bit more chance to develop the, the theme for, for Shriek. Uh, there's one, in my opinion, particularly cool sequence uh, at the end of Act 1 uh, in the Silent Woodlands. Uh, on the soundtrack, the music is called Ash and Bone. And this is a sequence where Shriek is uh, stalking uh, stalking, uh, the stalking you through uh, through the silent woodlands, and it's a chance to like combine Shriek's theme and Ori's theme and Ku's theme. Um, so that one that one was particularly fun to do. Um, and then, uh, of course, the the spider, <laughs> the spider has her own theme as well. Uh, she basically has an entire level um, in, in environment dedicated to her, and also a boss fight. So. Um, that's just like a few places where we're able to establish uh, a few characters where we're able to establish uh, new themes uh, and try to weave them into the soundtrack. Yeah, and, and we've we've spoken a lot about how you weave those themes into the soundtrack. But one thing that occurred to me is I don't think we actually spoke much about your actual process of composing these themes because you've got, I mean, basically from the script and I assume the storyboards right up to the final product. I'm just really interested in how you develop such big themes that you know are going to mean a lot to the game and, and maybe be repackaged in different ways. Um, well, my uh, process on Ori is I do I do have all of the content uh, for the game, uh, not just the artwork, but I actually have access to all of the, the builds of the game. Um, so by the time it comes to around to me, like really digging in and doing my job, which is uh, you know, I, I, most of the music gets written in the later part of development, but I spend the earlier part of development thinking about what exactly do I want to do, and because I'm able to play the game from a very early stage, I have an intimate knowledge far better than most people on the team making the game, actually, because they're all just focused on like one certain area. Um, I have a better knowledge of the game than maybe almost anyone else may making it. Um, I certainly have a better knowledge than anyone playing it. Um, so it means that when it comes down to actually writing the music and coming up with the, the different sounds and palettes for different areas, I kind of have a very good idea about what I'm going to do before I start doing it. Like a lot of things, when you're a composer, you, you have, you're, you're faced with the blank canvas and the goal at the beginning is to remove, for me, is to remove as many choices as possible. And 
the game itself dictates a lot of those choices to me. Now, if I hadn't played the game, it would be harder for me to remove those choices and decisions. But because I have an intimate knowledge of the game, a lot of the choices are made for me, or at least uh, I've I've made choices based on what I've played um, that are based on my taste and what I think would be best for the game. Now, it's interesting because it is very much a game and you playing it is integral to the whole process. But there was an interesting thing I read in, a, in another interview with you where you were talking about um, a general feeling of not wanting it to feel like a video game, <laughs> which I thought was interesting. And um, And what I wanted to ask about with that is, so in that case, what specifically do you avoid and what do you lead into to try and avoid that feeling? The main thing, and obviously every game is different, um, but the main thing in Ori is I, I don't want things to break immersion. Uh, anything that breaks immersion in a game like Ori is bad. And if you watch people play Ori for the first time, uh, and even if they haven't played a platformer before, if you watch them play it, they generally don't stop. And it's interesting to ask, like they generally don't stop for like two, at least two to three hours because to stop to, to 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 break the immersion the player has to willingly want to stop playing um we have and there's lots of contributing factors that go into this it's not just music um so the way you know one of the ways we do it everything is continuous in in the game there's no loading screens um and originally in blind forest uh quite early on it was planned you know that 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 we wouldn't have like the game's camera scroll with you but they, the game was just going to be made up uh of different screens um but then one day our tech tech team wrote a message on skype and we're like yep hey guys we've got no loading screens now and that meant there's no break um, so if you want to stop playing, you have to press start and bring up the, the pause menu. Another thing that helps is that the when you die, you respawn extremely quickly. Like You die and you're back playing within a second. Uh, and I think that's very important. It kind of keeps you engaged with the game. Um, we're also throwing new things at you all the time. New environments, new visuals, new abilities, uh, new monsters. So that that keeps things that keeps things interesting and engaging for the player um now with music one of the things that i don't like for this game uh anything is anything that feels gimmicky or gamey uh and for example one very common thing to do in video games is to amp up the music whenever you're in combat but you're in and out of combat so quickly in ori that it would feel gimmicky if a little combat cue came in for like five seconds and then disappeared and that actually is less immersive and i'm a big proponent of sound telling the story as much as music and sound will communicate that you're in combat and it's enough so there's no reason to change the music where i do decide to change the music i choose subtle places to change it or what i like to call switches so an obvious switch I'm going to use film as an example because it's uh, it's such an easy example for people to visualize. One of the biggest problems composers have in film or game or TV is how to get out of a piece of music like once it's started. And I'm going to use the simple visual of a door closing. When a door closing, you have the visual of something closing, but you also have the sound, and the sound acts as a natural cutoff for uh, for something to end. So you can just end the music when the door closes. And it's that equivalent that I'm looking for in the game. And this is another reason why I play the game so rigorously is because I'm looking for as many of those switches as possible to change the music. I'm going to give a very simple example from the game. Uh, there is a room in the game in the water mill and it is a puzzle room, uh, a platform puzzle room that rotates every time you pull a lever. So the first time you enter this room, a piece of music plays and you you know you do all the platforming required and you get to this lever and what happens when you pull the lever is that the level rotates by 90 degrees which is kind of trippy and weird it's kind of a cool video gamey thing but what the lever does it acts as that door that i just referenced it that lever triggers a sound and it triggers an animation of the room turning and it allows me to end the previous piece of music 
And once the room has rotated, I start a new piece of music that is slightly increased in tension and tempo and pitch that reflects the slightly more difficult platforming that the player has to get through. And then the player does that, and then they reach the lever again, and they pull the lever, and it switches by 90 degrees, and the same thing happens. The music ends, and then a new version of the same piece of music plays. So those switches are all over the game, and because they're invisible to the player, because they're covered up by the pulling of the lever and the sound effect of the pulling of the lever, um, it never, ever breaks immersion. So that's always my approach for a game like Ori, is how can I change the music? music and not make it feel gamey because i feel that music changes that you can hear are very gamey yeah like just absolute stop and then into the next yep. level straight away or 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 or, fa- or just like a, a a crude fade out like sometimes crude fade outs can't be avoided but like you you want to avoid them as as much as possible so that that's the kind of thing i'm looking for yeah because i remember asking you about uh dynamic elements when we last spoke and and then speaking about it's almost kind of dynamic illusions kind of the illusion of dynamic music in a way so i was going to ask if if that continued on to this game that very much seems like the case but was there then any ways that you um were able to uh, adapt it or kind of grow it for this for this sequel I would just say that it's definitely more granular than it was before. Um, I think the where one of the the biggest differences was felt is is in the boss fights uh, because they are um, there aren't really any obvious uh, switches in those because they're just continuous sequences that the player might be playing for a very long time. But what we were able to do. The, the, the boss fights are divided up into different phases. So you might start you'll, you'll start off with the intro to the boss fight. That's one music cue. Um, then you'll have phase one of the boss fight, which is combat, and you've got to learn a certain set of moves. Then phase two might be a chase sequence, which is part of the boss fight. And then phase three is the final bit of combat with the boss. And then when you defeat the boss, you've got to have an outro as well. So actually in one boss fight sequence, you might have five different cues. Uh, And the cool thing that we were able to do on this one um, was we were able to script the music to make sure that only it only changes at a certain place. So, for example, in the, the spider boss, um, once you trigger the chase sequence, that sets up a new piece of music that is a little bit more transitional. And that transitional piece of music gets you to the next phase of the music, which is uh, when the spider is down to 50% of its health. Um, and the reason I have the change is because I want to communicate to the player uh, emotionally that you're winning. So the first phase of the combat music for the boss uh, fight with uh, the spider is very tense uh, and much more uh, minor keys and not very optimistic at all. It's designed to make you feel terrified. Um, but then the second half this uh, and the final phase of the, um, the combat is much more optimistic and it harkens back to the more optimistic moments in the Blind Forest soundtrack when you feel like you're winning. Um, and that, I've, I've read comments on YouTube that they're like, that moment in the music helped me keep going against more of the spider because it, the spider is one of the tougher bosses in the game. Um, so just having that ability to be able to switch on the fly based entirely on what's happening in the game in real time, uh, as opposed to only using the illusion of switches was something uh, that we were not able to do on the first game. Right, and that, that's really, really interesting as well because um, there, there are times in the past when bosses, and particularly boss themes, can be really, really relentless. So, like, as in just non-stop, you've got to fight this thing for 30 minutes and it's the same two-minute loop for the whole thing. It's just to hear that, that response that you've got from a player of... Um, getting fed to go on with it from the music that's really interesting to hear we've got a mix yeah the boss fights are a mix of linear tracks and looping tracks so the intro is obviously that starts and that finishes then you have the first loop for the first combat phase then you have the transitional piece which you only hear once and then you have the second loop for the second combat phase and then you have uh, and then you have the outro and most and and that covers you know, the loops themselves most of my loops are three minutes long um so even if you uh 
even if you're fighting the boss for for 20 minutes you're only going to hear a loop three times um so that definitely that definitely helps with the relentless aspect of it but also boss fight music doesn't need to be relentless for the whole time if you if you listen to more of the spider there are parts where the music and the orchestration comes down quite significantly because if it's loud all the time you just become numb to it um and ori isn't that kind of game where it's just like in your face for the entire experience it's got to have the ebb and flow and and also getting quieter in the music it allows the sound effects to have their moments so you kind of got this ballet between the sound and the music and also of course you know all the visuals and the animation and everything else that's going on you don't really want to the, the game's already quite overwhelming in terms of uh in terms of sensations um so you don't need to work so hard to in, in at least in the music um and so sometimes i take a step back but sometimes i take a step forward um and of yeah, course I, I was going to say that um the music is already kind of powerful enough simply by being rendered by the philharmonia orchestra which is something of course i wanted to get into is um why the switch over to the new orchestra and how was it to work with these this time with um with the uh, the London group, uh, I wanted to. I, I, have to, I have to admit, I've always wanted to record at Air Studios, so that was that was one factor. Um, it would have been, um, if we had the budget for it in the first game, it would have been my choice to to record there. Um, I also wanted a bigger group, and for a bigger group, you need a, a bigger room. Uh, so Air Studios is, it can accommodate like the increased uh, number of players. Um, but uh, you know, also I have to be honest, I'm I'm British. Right. <laughs> so, um, like honestly, that honestly that is as much to do with it um, as anything else. I'm British, and I just wanted to uh, work in my own country. Obviously, I live out here in America. In America, um, but for this, like I really wanted to to get the the best of my countrymen, as it were. Um, so um, yeah, it was a mix of like things being on the bucket list, but also um, that orchestra is, is really 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 good and i've worked with them before um so i wanted to um you know i wanted to give them a chance to get their interpretation of uh, of the ori music i mean i'll also say this you know and this kind of ties back into what i was talking about this is ori 2 not ori 1.5 um the music for this game is not the same philosophically as the first one the first one i would say has a naive charm to it but Ori's grown up in this game. It's uh, I th I think the soundtrack reflects his maturity. It perhaps reflects my increasing maturity as a composer as well. I'm in a very different place to where I was where I was in 2013 and 2014 when I wrote the Blind Forest soundtrack. And I also think it reflects Moon Studios where they're at as a studio. Ori in the Blind Forest was their first game, and this is the second game. And I think. I think we've all grown up with Ori together and thus the bigger group and the different location for the for the orchestra was really just kind of a reflection of, you know, everyone growing up and it's a bit more of a it's a slightly more serious game with a with a serious theme and when when you get to the end especially I, I obviously I'm not going to talk about the ending um, but I think you'll understand um, why we why we got to where we are and uh, the, the ending in particular, if you played the first game, has a particular weight and gravitas to it. Um, and you might feel happy or you might feel sad. It depends on it depends on where you, this is. This is kind of cheesy, but it depends on where you are at in your life, how you will respond to the ending uh, and what you will feel. I do know that our ending has raised talking points which is i'm actually happy about because it means that people actually care uh, it's not a it's not a cheap throwaway ending and as a studio we kind of stay true to our vision um you know it's it's funny you mentioned you know i, I do read I, I i do read the comments and um i think some people may have gone into this game perhaps expecting it to be Ori 1.5 and we're perhaps a little bit surprised with how um, different the game is. It's still it's still Ori, but it's very much uh, a, a very much more uh, grown up Ori. Um, and I think once people got rid of their preconceptions about the game and actually about the soundtrack, um, they were able to appreciate it on its own merits and see that it is, uh, in my opinion, and I think most people's opinion, a, a superior game to the first one. 
Well, absolutely, and th this is why I came into this with um, expansion as a key word, and I feel like that's kind of got a bad connotation in games now, like DLC, expansion. Yep. I don't mean it like that at all. I mean it as like a real growth, like what you're talking about with Ori being older and everything like that. And um, it's also funny, funny what you mentioned about the, the British thing, because I had an odd sense of pride when I looked up at the credits list myself and saw the Pinewood voices on there. Um, because not only am I British myself, obviously, but um, spoken about the Pinewood voices a few times on this show in the past when they've shown up on video game soundtracks. Uh, so what was it like to bring them into it and, and to work with them? Um, well, we didn't have a live choir on the first game, and uh, it was something that I really wanted to do. I mean, choirs are expensive to record because you need you need a lot of singers to get that sound. Um, but uh, I was just like, I need to make it happen, and I'm so glad I did because in the scenes that require weight and gravitas, they there there is nothing like a live choir, um, and they they really nailed what they needed to do, and they they really got to sing quite a range of stuff. Um, obviously, they got a lot of the emotional content, uh, especially in the ending. Um, there's, there's so much choir in the end. Um, and uh, But they also got to sing on the boss fights. If you listen to the Quolock boss fight track, you'll, you'll hear them chanting Quolock in the background. You'll also hear them chanting. It's, it's a whisper chant uh, in the more of the spider track. Um, so they kind of got to do some of the more action-y stuff as well, as well as the, the epic sound and as well as the intimate sound. So they kind of got to do the, the full range and spectrum of musical emotion. Um, and working with them, honestly, uh, we got through so much content. Uh, I, I'm still amazed at what we were able to get through because uh, it is such a, a, a big score. Um, but they were super professional throughout um, and I can't wait to work with them again on well, something. <laughs> yeah, because there is some absolutely amazing vocal stuff going on in this. Like one thing that really gripped out at me was like these almost like terrifying was what it was going for. These big, quick portamentos, really fast. Oh, in, in how in mm. how Yes. So, so that that cue uh, how is uh, in probably the first 10 minutes of the game. <laughs> There's a chase sequence. Um, it's uh, it's kind of you know, most people will start the game and think oh, okay we've got we're on easy street you know we're just kind of like learning the controls and then it's like nope we're gonna we're gonna throw a chase scene at you in the first ten minutes um, and I was like okay well how can we you know what's what's a cool sound and because it, it is quite it is quite scary and it's it's very dark and this chase scene uh, occurs in in a storm so it it, it does look it's, it's it's kind of almost biblical in terms of how bleak everything is um, so I was like well let's do the let's do the choir swoops and uh, the thing that took it over the top the choir swoops were already good but after I got into post-production I was like it just needs one little extra thing and I put uh, an echo on it and I was like okay that's it because the echo just gradually fades over the orchestra that's kind of chuntering away underneath um, and uh, yeah that combination of the choir swoop and the echo choir swoop uh, really brought that track together and uh, speaking about vocals, there's still yet more to speak about because, uh, of course, Aerily Brighton's back. Yep. Um, so, yeah, we br brought her back for the obviously the main theme uh, in the opening. And one cool thing about the opening of the, the game um, is that the title screen also is the first scene of the game so you press start and then just the, the menu disappears and you're all, you're immediately into the game one thing that we didn't do in blind forest is, is when you press start the music changes so you never if, if you press like start really quickly you actually never hear the whole main theme from start to finish and i always thought that was a shame but for this because we transition seamlessly into the first scene of the game, it is impossible to get to the next scene without hearing the main theme in full. Even if you like speed run it as fast as possible and press start and then just immediately move your character to where, uh, where he needs to go, um, you will always hear the main theme in full before you get to the next scene of the game. So that's something that I, I thought was pretty, pretty cool. Um, and yeah, she pops up in a couple of other places. I don't really want to spoil it because uh, where she pops up is entirely based on story. Um, and if you've played the first game and are familiar with Aerie's voice, um, and the tunes from the first game, then when they reoccur in this game, 
um, they should have maximum uh, emotional impact. Yeah, very, very distinctive uh, voice there. And also by a side, you've brought on uh, Kelsey, um, is it Myra? Oh, Mira. Uh, Kelsey Mira, yeah, Mira. Uh, so she, um, yeah, she sung on the Luma Pools uh, track, and that's uh, that's the only track she sung on. She has a very, <clears throat> she has a very unique, pure quality to her voice. It's a, it's it's obviously a different tone to what Airly, um, Airly offers. Um, and the Luma Pools is such a visually striking and different area of the game. I was like, I need something a little bit different here. Um, and she is singing uh, actually four lines um, of vocals in that track uh, at various points. Um, and the harmony in Luma Pools is edging towards jazz territory. It's not quite there, but it's close. Um, it's certainly more harmonically rich than any other area of the game. And again, it's all tied to the visuals. It's this beautiful, bright, vibrant area. Uh, and there's a, lot, there's a lot of underwater sections in the game as well. And I was just like, you know, this place needs to be a beacon of positivity because the game is so dark. Let's make it this one feel a little bit, a little bit different. Um, and yeah, the purity of her voice also layers really well with all of the other elements that are going on in that track. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to increase the uh, increase the variety. Um, you know, one of the great things about things uh, about the game being a sequel is that. Um, you have increased resources um, because if there's a sequel, it means the first game did well. Uh, so with increased resources, it gives you you know more opportunities to work with different musicians. Yeah, and, and um, you've worked with a lot of musicians in your time. I remember speaking about that in the last interview as well. And, and this, again, is another case because um, Kristen Nagus, of course, was, played a huge role in the first soundtrack. But it seems this time, again, the word is expansion because is it 20 woodwinds? I read this time around that she's played. Uh, yep, yep, 20, 20, uh, 20 different instruments. Uh, I mean, some of them you don't hear very much at all, and some of them you do. Um, so, yeah, uh, Kristen was kind of like my go-to source for um, trying out different melodies, because a lot of the melodies are featured on woodwind instruments in this game. Uh, so she's kind of a one-stop shop for, um, for getting great woodwind sounds. Um, and, yeah, there's so many tracks that she's featured on. My favourite... Um, probably being uh, in wonderment of winter um, she does a tremendous job on on that track um, leading with the melody and then joining in with the strings in the second half of the the music uh, yeah she's an absolute monster in the best way possible um, pretty much anything you give her it comes back like 24 hours later or sooner um, and I just slot it into the track and I'm like okay well that's done uh, so uh, yeah she's she's a genius and does she experiment much with the tracks? Improvise much? Uh, only if I ask her to. I'm I'm usually fairly. When it comes to Ori, I'm fairly controlling. With uh, with other stuff, um, I might ask her to improvise. But because there are a lot of established themes and melodies, the only things I let her improvise on are things like ornaments. Like the, the there's there's a way of ornamenting notes that can make things sound more Celtic or more Eastern. Um, and she's very good at adding those in because they're they're a pain to notate. And if I just write play in a Scottish style, um, she'll just do it and she'll understand what that means. Um, but like the core melodies and stuff, um, I generally am like, can you just make sure you just play the notes? Um, because obviously they're, a lot of them are based on establishing themes that I've spent time on or that are passed around the orchestra. So they kind of need to be the same. But when it, when it comes to like the small performance nuances, that's pretty much all her. Of course. And um, to finish up some of the discussion about the live instrumentation, you've also brought Laurent on board to play bass clarinet. So, yeah, he was um, he was actually part of the orchestra. I chose to credit him because the bass clarinet is is literally so much of Quolock's character. And Quolock is the NPC you spend most time with uh, in the game. Um, and the first time I heard his tone, I was like, oh my goodness, it could not be more perfect. One of the, it, it's funny, one of the things that was hardest to get approved was the cue for, for Quolock um, because bass clarinet samples are terrible. There is not a good one out there. Um, there's there's no good digital digital playback for a bass clarinet. Um, I've tried them all and they're all awful. So developers, make me a good one, please. Mm. Um, uh, but he just has this. As, and so just just before I talk about him, 
getting that by the team they were like this doesn't really work and i'm like you guys have to trust me it's not going to sound anything like this because this is just this is just because the computer samples sound bad um and then when i heard his tone and it has that warm rich low end to it i was like oh my goodness this could not be more perfect and then we put the live version in the game and everyone was like oh i understand now um so uh yeah he um he really was a tour de force because there's there is a lot of bass clarinet content and it really uses the full range of the instrument i think i think it might be one of my new favorite instruments because i've never bass clarinet is not an instrument that gets featured in scores period um but i i almost want to find a, an excuse to to use bass clarinet more now um because of what i was able to do on on this soundtrack absolutely that's really really interesting and um I, to kind of finish up our talk about will of the wisps before we end up in pandemic territory briefly <laughs> um i had to ask whether there's any way you've developed at all on the use of electronics because that was always going on in the background as well so so for this um yeah the, the synth element is still there I, I would say it's probably a little bit more orchestra heavy than the first game um but um i'll use the luma pools as an example there's a lot of synth work in that track um it's mostly just strings and vocals that are the, the live elements um one of the things that i did do um was have um some custom samples recorded for this uh for this game and then have them manipulated and most of the bell sounds you hear in this game are from those custom sampled recordings but what was done to take it even further they were processed into rhythmic loops um, that kind of like have a mix of um, the loops play back regularly, but they also can play in reverse. And when you combine those two sounds together, you get this really interesting uh, wash and texture of sounds. Um, so I did that a lot with some of the tonal percussion elements. The, the bells are a big component of Ori. If you if you listen to the soundtrack, they're in bells are in a lot of the tracks. Um, but bells and just pulses in general. Um, a lot of the pulses are synth based. Um, and again, if you listen to most of the tracks, you'll always hear some kind of pulse in the background because it is a platformer and I want to keep the player moving and a pulse naturally does that. Um, so uh, that side of things, it was more about getting custom content that was very specific to Ori because on the first game, due to budget reasons, um, I was using stuff that was mostly commercially available. But for this, um, I was able to hire someone to like, make make me the ori sound set so that i can compose with it and that's exactly what he did um for reference it was uh simon ashdown and he's a sound designer who works in bristol and uh some of his other credits include arrival the film arrival and uh into the spider-verse um so he's kind of knows what he's doing uh because those are some pretty great credits yeah i was gonna say arrival's one of the best films i've seen in recent memory i love that film yeah, he uh, he's responsible for, for some of the more esoteric uh, musical sound design elements uh, in that score. That's so, so cool. Uh, but I think otherwise we've basically done a good coverage of Will of the Wisps there without encroaching yep. on too many spoilers, I think, luckily. Yep. Uh, spoiler, spo spoiler free, uh, spoiler free talk. Yeah, which is very, very nice. And um, yeah, I've realised recently that I've actually done three live interviews throughout this whole pandemic thing, and it's only occurred to me today to actually ask, like, how this might be affecting the industry, if at all. I think um, if we if we're to judge uh, from Twitter and just numbers, uh, I think more well, more people are playing games than ever uh, because there's not much else to do. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, Netflix numbers are up. I know Netflix have had to reduce their streaming quality to ease the pressure on server bandwidth, um, but I think it's the same for games. Like, it, you know, uh, if I'm looking at it, and, and this truly doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things, but you know, we released Ori right at the beginning before just before all of the lockdown started happening and uh as a result i think more people have been playing ori than might have if you know the world was if we were still all going to work um because obviously people are staying at home and they have more time and it means we've had a we've had a lot of eyeballs on ori there's obviously a, there's there's been a slew of amazing games that have come out recently doom eternal animal crossing and you know just so many people are playing games and it's uh 
Um, what, what I what I do hope is that once all this is over, uh, is that people remember that they turned to art when they uh, when they were stuck inside. Um, you know, people are reading more, people are watching more films, watching more TV shows, playing more games, um, and uh, I think. I have a good feeling that people will just be more appreciative of what they have in general uh, once this is all over. Not in the grand scheme of things, the entertainment industry is not that important. But I think um, you know people will be more appreciative of their family and their friends, and also the people who are you know keeping people alive. That is the obviously the most important thing. Um, but also the people that have kept them entertained uh, while they've been at home. Uh, I generally I do get the feeling. That if there is going to be a silver lining uh, in this very dark cloud, um, it will be that, generally speaking, I think uh, we'll all be more appreciative of each other. That at least is my hope. Yeah, it is almost like a worldwide wake-up call. Now, I certainly yes. hope there is yep. going to be some positivity coming out of this. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's going to take a while to recover. Um, uh, but um, I do feel... Yeah, obviously I'm, I'm in America, um, and obviously attitudes uh, are different here than they are in England. But I do feel, uh, I actually feel like people are behaving. Uh, people are staying inside in California. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't actually help that unusually it's been five days of rain here right. in California consecutively, which just doesn't happen. Um, so uh, yeah, people have been forced to stay inside. Um, uh, but uh, I do feel like people are, uh, people are behaving here, uh, which I'm pleasantly surprised with. Uh, so I know California is doing better at flattening the curve than was expected. Um, hopefully that is the case across the country. But yeah, I mean, we will uh we will get through it um humans have uh, an amazing ability to adapt and move on um we've pulled through we've pulled through worse before um so um yes i remain i i, I remain optimistic i think being optimistic is, is 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 better than being negative in times like this yeah that's a good note to end on i hope any listeners are feeling nice and encouraged <laughs> right now yep uh, but yeah, other than that, I just hope you stay safe, uh, Gareth, and thanks for coming on yet again. Yep, likewise, Lee. Thank you so much. <laughs>